Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, we're joined by Stefan Petronek. He is an American writer and editor of Breakthrough Technology Alert. He also was a previous editor of Discover Magazine and the Washington Post Magazine as well. He's also the founding editor and editor-in-chief of This Old House Magazine for Time, Inc., and was senior editor for Science at Life Magazine. What does all this mean for the listener? Well, today we're going to be talking about how we'll live on Mars, which is the topic of his new book. We're going to be talking about a fictitious mission to Mars in 2033 on a rocket called Daedeus, calling six uniquely qualified astronauts who will actually do this very thing. I'd like to welcome the Beyond 50 radio program today, our guest, Stefan Petronak. Thank you for joining us here on the program today. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, living on Mars, you know, we just recently had that movie, you know, uh, about living on Mars, you know, The Martian, that is, with Matt Damon. What are the possibilities of doing this? Let's talk about the real logistics of what it is to be able to do something that seems kind of to be a real stretch. Well, there are two things involved here. One is going to Mars and exploring Mars with humans on the surface, and the other is sending people to Mars to live there permanently. And the first, just going to Mars and exploring it, could have been done as early as 1982. Um, Werner von Braun, who was responsible for building the Saturn V rocket, which was the largest machine ever built at the time and probably the most magnificent, Werner von Braun was beating on the door of Richard Nixon and walking the halls of Congress as the Apollo program came to an end in the late 70s, saying that he could put humans on Mars in the early 1980s. And instead, Nixon decided to build the space shuttle. Um, The cost of the space shuttle was astronomical. We did 135 flights, and they each cost about a billion and a half dollars apiece. If we had one-fourth of that money, uh, we would have to spend on getting people to Mars. We'd have them there already. The thing that's important to remember about getting humans to Mars is that we have had the technology to do this for at least 30 years. This is not rocket science anymore, so to speak. Um, This is all known technology to do it. But the second part of this, which is living on Mars, is far more complex and far more costly. But it's mostly about money. It's not about technology. We have the technology to make what we need to live on Mars, and Mars has the resources for us to make what we need to live on Mars. Now, I think it's really interesting when you think about the technology that's involved to, uh, to, to live on Mars. But first of all, let's talk about from Earth to Mars. What does it take? What is the time does it take to get from the Earth to Mars itself? Well, right now with conventional rocketry, it's about a 240-day trip, about uh, eight months. It's a long trip um, in a tight container, um, and uh, the psychology that's involved in that is probably significant. Um, but it's not a particularly dangerous trip. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's all current technology rocketry. Um, we know how to do this. Um, there are even people like billionaire Dennis Tito who, you know, want to buy a Falcon Heavy rocket from SpaceX and and put a couple in it and have them do a flyby of Mars and return to Earth. Um, He had proposed that for 2018. That's a 501-day trip, round trip, but that's all within current technology. Now, let's talk about uh, the kind of people who would actually go on a trip like this. Uh, What do they look for as far as uh, the kind of people that would be able to make a trip like this? Well, I think one of the biggest surprises is, even though in the show we show people with very specific skill sets, like, you know, if I was going to Mars with six people, um, the way we envision it in the show for the very first time, I'd definitely want a doctor aboard, I'd want an engineer aboard, um, you'd want people who really know how to work together, um, and that's very e- it's very easy to find that out. You throw six people into a small container and give them a challenging project, and you'll find out within a week whether or not they're suited to make a trip like that together. So for a first trip, you want some pretty specific kinds of people to go, but beyond that, 
traveling in space and making a new life on another planet is not as complicated as it seems and doesn't require specific skill sets. We now regularly send um, astronauts into space, or, and when we had the space shuttle, we did this all the time, uh, sent people into space who had just minimal training um, to take care of themselves in a situation like on the International Space Station or in the space shuttle. And the truth is that John Glenn, when he was well into his 70s, <coughs> flew on the space shuttle. Charlie Bolden, who is the current um, director of NASA, has said several times to me that he is just waiting till he's in his 70s to go into space. You don't, you don't have to be necessarily fit. Um, it would be good to be psychologically fit and to be a person who's uh, healthy in his head. But as far as the physical abilities, you don't really need anything very special. Now, it's interesting because uh, as I was talking with my uh, wife uh, the other night about this, I said, you know, there was a time that I served in the United States Navy, and the longest time that I remember spending at sea was uh, steaming from Europe to the United States was 32 days. And that was pretty rough. You know, 32 days, you're out at sea, you pretty much don't see anything. <laughs> you're excited if you see a bird after a while. And, you know, she got her the idea, of course, that maybe eventually civilians might be uh, within this loop of the possibility of going to Mars. And I thought to myself, well, I wonder how eight people, seven people, ten people, however many people would be going to Mars would be able to tolerate an eight-month trip, <laughs> you know, to Mars. Tell us about what's really involved in being able to be in the mental state of being able to make a trip that's so long. Well, I, you know, it does depend on the individual, and but it also depends on the environment. I think one of the things we're going to do, or that we will do initially, is recognize up front that this is a difficult trip and that people have to be well entertained and have challenging things to do. We have learned from our own space program that um, you need to keep it, keep people busy when they're in space. When we send people up to the International Space Station, they're just constantly busy. They have all kinds of projects, all kinds of experiments that they're running all the time. Um, so you're not just going to sit back in a chair and enjoy the ride. You're going to be kept busy. There are going to be a lot of challenging things to do. There's going to be a lot of interesting things to do. Um, Elon Musk, the CEO of SpaceX, who founded a company that is dedicated to only one proposition, which is creating a sustainable human presence on Mars. Uh, when he introduced his Mars colonizer rocket, which will carry 80 people at once, um, this August at an international aeronautical meeting, um, he said that the trip should be fun, that you know we should figure out how to keep people entertained and we should figure out how to... Um, Make this an enjoyable trip, and I, you know, I think we have the capability of doing that. Um, sealing a bunch of guys up in a in a in a rolling ship, crossing the North Atlantic, uh, probably in the middle of winter, is you know not my idea of fun. But this won't be a voyage that's like that. Now let's talk about some of the differences between uh, what it would be like to be on Mars versus Earth. Now I understand that a year on Mars lasts 687 Earth days, so that's basically twice as long as a year here on Earth. Yeah, the way to look at that is that summer lasts twice as long. <laughs> and actually, <laughs> <There you go. laughs> actually, Mars has an elliptical orbit, so. Um, depending on whether you're in the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere, you can actually have a longer summer and a shorter winter. And I actually think um, over a period of time we'll probably establish two major um, locations on Mars where people live and they will actually migrate um, from one to the other because there's intense cold on Mars and you want to spend as much time in summer as you can. So a year on Mars is twice as long as a year on Earth, but a day on Mars is only 39 minutes longer than a day on Earth. So um, it's 24 hours and 39 minutes. So Mars time and Earth time are not really that different on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, temperatures are pretty interesting here, as I understand at the equator, that it would be about 75 degrees is a high temperature, but it gets as low as minus 100 Boy, that's that's 
quite a, a difference there. It even gets colder than that. It can get down to minus 150 um, at night. Yeah, this it, it's a little misleading to say that, you know, the temperature at the equator in the middle of summer, I should point out, um, on kind of an ideal day could reach about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, because actually, if that's very close to the surface um, where you're getting some radiant heat from the surface itself. If you go up 10, 15, 20 feet, it's probably half that temperature. So it's it's not a lot of warmth, even on a perfect day in summer. It's a cold place. There's no question about it. But Antarctica is uh, uh, many times and in many days equally as cold. And on Antarctica, because Earth's atmosphere is 100 times thicker than Mars, um, you get cold winds, which, you know, as we know, that's why we have something called a wind chill factor to really tell us how cold stuff is. So the atmosphere on Mars is so thin that even a 200-mile-an-hour wind would hardly push against you. So you're not going to have that kind of effect from it. And uh, But you will, you know, it's a harsh place to live. There's no question about it. And until we can terraform the planet and begin to warm it up, which we can actually do with current technologies, then um, you're going to live indoors most of the time. And you're going to live shielded from the high radiation exposures that you get on the surface. It's going to be kind of an underground indoor life. But that's exactly what we have in Antarctica, too. And a lot of people seem to like it there and really kind of thrive on the challenge of living in a severe climate. I mean, to be perfectly honest, I don't know if you've ever been to Minnesota in February, but it's so cold, it's almost unbelievable. And it's cold because it's wet, because it, there's a lot of hu relative humidity, and there's a lot of wind. It's not just the temperature. So I don't really think it's going to be quite as bad as it seems on Mars. And eventually, we will terraform the planet and begin to warm it up. And it will begin, you know, it's really conceivable that within 100 to 200 years, you could make at least around the equator or maybe 10 degrees north latitude, 10 degrees south latitude, in, the, in a band around Mars. You would have running water during the day. Um, you would have lakes. You would have streams. You'll have snow. You'll have rain. And you'll have a climate that's pretty much like British Columbia. Now, I understand that there's something like 100 or, no, excuse me, uh, a million or more cubic miles of water, and you talk about terraforming Mars. What would or how long would something like that actually take once we started it? What would be involved? The, the time is equal to the amount of money you're willing to spend. The one of the, One of the quickest and in a sense, easiest ways to do it, but also one of the most expensive, is to build a very large solar mirror. And this is basically kind of like a solar sail. It's an incredibly thin um, piece of fabric that's shiny on one side, sprayed with aluminum. Um, and you would put it in what's called a stay-tight orbit, which kind of holds it in one place on Mars. And you would, f and you would just angle it so that the sun's rays hitting it would reflect on the South Pole or the North Pole, where there's incredible amounts of frozen carbon dioxide. And it's not very frozen. It's just a few degrees below um, the temperature required to freeze it. So just a temperature rise of 5, 6, 7, 8 degrees um, by using this kind of solar sail, this kind of solar mirror, just to, and just focusing it in the right place, just a small temperature rise would release incredible amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which would begin to create a runaway greenhouse effect. And around the equator, there's a lot of water on Mars. In fact, if the peop there are some estimates that if you melted all the water that's just on the surface of Mars in glaciers and, and frozen in the soil, that you would have three, you, you would, could cover the entire planet 300 feet deep in water. So there's a lot of water there, but it, it's all frozen. So if you start heating the planet up just a few degrees and you get this runaway greenhouse effect, um, you would start having running water ar uh, in areas around the equator very, very quickly. Now, that could happen in as little as 30 years, but it's very expensive to do. My guess is it's going to be 100 to 200 years before we do that because the cost is so high. 
Now, it's interesting, too, to think about the fact that also on Mars that it's pretty much, as I understand, 95% carbon dioxide. <laughs> now, that would take some doing to be able to, to be able to have people live on a planet like this because of what we require, which is oxygen and nitrogen. Uh, now, talk about how they would be able to solve something like that. Well, there's some major problems living on Mars. I mean, you know, you have to have food, shelter, clothing, and water to live on Earth. You have to have food, shelter, clothing, water, and oxygen to live on Mars. Um, we NASA has invented a machine that's uh, dubbed MOXIE, M-O-X-I-E, that was invented at uh, MIT, and it's kind of a reverse fuel cell, and it can suck in the Martian atmosphere of CO2, which is CO2 is carbon and two oxygen atoms, and those oxygen atoms are much, much bigger than the carbon atom. So CO2 is actually 72% oxygen. And once you strip off the carbon atom, you have a very breathable kind of environment. So we have a machine that can do that, and in fact a very small version of that machine is going up on the next Curiosity rover in 2020 to Mars, and it will make enough oxygen. It's going to be a test, but it is expected to make enough oxygen, and it's a little box, to keep one person alive indefinitely. So we can do this. We really have the technology for this. Now, converting an entire atmosphere that is now 95 96% carbon dioxide, converting an entire atmosphere to a breathable atmosphere for humans, and humans can't breathe more than 5% carbon dioxide or they begin to pass out, um, to create a breathable atmosphere is something that I think could take hundreds and hundreds of years, perhaps a thousand years. It's a very complicated process. Um, but it's technically within the, the range of possibilities. Again, it's incredibly expensive um, and it's incredibly complicated, but we could actually do it. And if when you start heating up the planet, you get this, you get this synergistic effect. When you start having flowing water around the equator, all of a sudden you'll have water vapor um, going into the Mars atmosphere, which will make it even thicker, which will warm it up even more. So there are a lot of nitrates in the soil in Mars. Um, there are ways to heat that soil up so that it releases the nitrates, which are nitrogen. 78% of what we breathe on Earth is nitrogen. It's an inner, for us, it's a basically inner, inert gas. Um, and about, we breathe about 21-22% oxygen. So um, we're going to need a buffer gas on Mars as well, and that probably will be nitrogen. Once you have, When you heat the planet up and you have running water, you'll actually be able to grow crops outside because, as it turns out, all, all the plants we know of love carbon dioxide. And with very minor genetic modifications, they'll be able to suck in the carbon dioxide and release oxygen just as they do on Earth. If we killed all the plants on Earth, humans would be dead very quickly because so much of our oxygen supply is actually created by plants. So it's something that can be done, it's a, it, but it is the longest-term problem on Mars. I think for hundreds of years, when people go outside on Mars, they will wear a very simple, small breathing device that may cover their mouth and their nose. Um, but other than that, um, you know, we will be able to terraform the planet, so it's a pretty livable place. Now, one of the things, too, when it comes to uh, extracting water, you were talking about a water vapor absorption reactor in your book. Tell us about what that is. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a very simple device, and actually something quite like it is in use in lots of buildings in the, in, in the United States and around the world. It's basically a dehumidifier. So you have, there's a mineral that exists in large quantities on Earth and also on Mars called zeolite. And when you put a bed of zeolite in a box and you put a fan at one end and you just blow some of the um, Martian atmosphere across the zeolite, it absorbs water like crazy. And then you just squeeze it and you have all the water you want to drink. I mean, you would probably distill it after that, but that's a very simple process also. And it turns out that the Martian atmosphere is 100% humid about 50% of the time. So most nights, 
on Mars, the atmosphere is extremely humid, almost ready to become a fog. So WAVAR will be able to deliver in the short run uh, before we learn how to drill into the Martian soil far enough to find actually running water below the surface, which probably exists in a lot of places, um, just as it does on Earth. Um, until we get to that stage of development, the WAVAR machine will provide all the water we need. Now, it's really interesting as you talk about, uh, you know, terraforming and, of course, you know, oxygen being the challenge, uh, you need the water. Now, uh, and growing plants here, uh, what are the probabilities of being able to start doing something like this as, uh, as we are able to land on Mars? I think, I think we'll grow plants from day one, uh, but we'll grow them in a um, modified greenhouse kind of environment. I don't think we'll actually have what we think of as traditional greenhouses where they're open to sunlight but enclosed. Um, the plants plants have to exist in a, in a greenhouse environment. They have to exist in, in they don't have to exist in, a, in the same kind of pressure that we have on Earth, which is 15 pounds per square inch, but they probably have to have about 5 pounds per square inch. Um, we know that um, the Martian soil, which is called regolith, it's very similar to a product most of us are familiar with, which is kitty litter. And uh, cat litter is, is a clay that absorbs water regularly, call, uh, re, uh, absorbs water easily. It's a clay called smectite. And most of the Martian soil is, is this clay. And we've done experiments um, in Holland where NASA supplied uh, Dutch greenhouse growers with soil that they think is very, very similar to what's found on Mars. And we found that every seed we put in there, when we add water and, and a little fertilizer, actually germinates and grows into a plant. So we'll be able to grow some of our food from the get-go on Mars, but for a long time, until we begin warming up the planet, it will probably not be more than about 20% of our diet at the most. And the one thing that people on Mars will be completely reliant on Earth for for probably at least the first hundred years is resupply of food. And that food will all come freeze-dried because every ounce and every pound matters and we're not going to move Mars, we're not going to move water from Earth to Mars. So um, there will be regular shipments of freeze-dried food um, and food products that go to Mars from Earth for a long time. But there's huge psychological value, and psychological value is going to be very important on Mars. There's huge psychological value in having something crunchy and fresh you can put in your mouth. So we will probably grow things like lettuces and carrots and mushrooms and some common vegetables on Mars just to provide that kind of psychological boost of something that um, isn't in a tube that you added water to. <laughs> You know, now I found this kind of funny. Uh, now, first of all, they wouldn't just be eating potatoes and hoping for a long time supply of ketchup. I understand. Right. <laughs> That's I correct. That, I thought, how in the hell are you going to be able to live on potatoes for that long? It's got to be a little bit better than that, I would hope. But now, what I found interesting as I was reading in your book, uh, 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 I, I got a kick out of that chapter, the next gold rush, and I thought. Only humans can think of something like this. <laughs> you know, how do we capitalize on a situation like this? And you say that, uh, you know, that, uh, that what people would probably most likely make money in is helping others get to the moon or to, to Mars. And it reminded me, and you even titled this chapter The Next Gold Rush, that there were a lot of people that went out, you know, the 49ers, you, you name the whole thing, and really the people who made the most money were the people that were handing out the shovels, the picks, and, uh, of course, the pans for gold, not actually the people who found it. <laughs> Pretty and and also the people who built the ships. You have to right. remember then the Panama Canal didn't exist then, so people were leaving the East Coast filling ships. There would be like 20, 30, 40 ships that would sail every day from the East Coast of the United States during the gold rush years, and they would go all the way around Cape Horn, an 11,000-mile trip all the way up to San Francisco. And those people who owned the shipping routes, they're the ones who made all the, all the real money. But you're right, the people who, who you know, 
provided the prospectors with their food and with their tools and with their tents and so forth and a mule to pull stuff. They were the people who made all the money. And, you know, Elon Musk, who has started a company called SpaceX, which has only one goal in mind, which is to create sustainable life on Mars, is planning on selling people tickets to go there for anywhere from about 200000 to $500,000 one way. So um, he's almost setting up an airline. He's, you know, he's he announced this summer the architecture of this Mars colonizer rocket that will carry 80 people at a time, and he intends by the year 2050 to have built a thousand such rockets, all of which will be reusable, and to be ferrying 80,000 people to Mars in one trip. And multiply that times three hundred fifty or four hundred thousand dollars for a ticket. That's quite a business. Now, the other thing to consider too, if uh, as our listeners are are, are are tuning in and thinking to themselves, you know, that might not be a bad idea. I wonder what it would be like to live on Mars. Well, we've kind of outlined some of the things you might want to consider before you decide to leave Earth. But one of the biggest things is, as you said, it's a one-way ticket. It sounds like. Well, I mean, there will be the option to go back, and there will always be circumstances where people will want to go back. But the best analogy to going to Mars is the European um, invasion, so to speak, of the Americas. You know, in 1620, one ship sails from Europe and establishes a colony at Plymouth Rock. And two years later, about 20% of those people are dead, and only one ship has, has come. But 30 years later, Boston is a city of 20,000 people, and there are hundreds, if not thousands, of ships coming every summer. So it's going to have that kind of multiplier effect. Once people start going and there's an infrastructure built and some kind of reasonable living conditions for people, a lot of people are going to choose to go. Jobs are going to be better on Mars. There are going to be more jobs than, than there are probably people who want to go to Mars, um, it's, it's going to be quite an interesting economy. Now, I understand that National Geographic has produced, uh, which will uh, be premiered on Monday, November 14th, uh, so it already has. It's called Mars. There's some pretty heavy hitters that are involved with this project here. Tell us about that. Well, the series is based on my book, How We'll Live on Mars, and the book before it was even published was optioned by a company called Radical Media, and they make documentaries. And our thought initially was that, um, you know, this might be a one-hour, maybe at the most a two-hour series. It would go to Netflix or go to HBO. Um, but when we talked to Elon Musk about getting access to SpaceX, and uh, no one gets access to SpaceX. They're, they're very media shy. Um, when we talked to him about being able to film what they were doing and kind of an... Uh, and getting a lot of access to them, he said that he would be much more comfortable uh, doing this if the if we picked a director he was familiar with, and it turned out with Ron Howard, and he suggested Ron Howard, and we kind of assumed Ron, even though Radical had dealt with Ron Howard's company Imagine Productions a number of times, you know, as soon as they read the, as soon as Ron Howard and his partner Brian Glazer read the book, they said, "Yep, we're in," and then it turns out that um, most of the things that Imagine Productions does, Fox has first right of refusal on. Fox saw the project and immediately, like within 48 hours, said, yes, we want to do this and we want to use this as the primary vehicle for the relaunch of the National Geographic Channel, which we're investing a small fortune in. And it turned into a six-hour series. And uh, the series is part drama and part big, what we call big thinkers, um, you know, people like Elon Musk and Charlie Bolden and uh, Jim Lovell, who was the commander of Apollo 13, me, and a number of other significant people who are familiar with Mars and the problems of getting to Mars. So about half the program is interviews and these talking heads commenting on what it will be like to go to Mars, and half of it is this dramatic action. But I will tell you that this dramatic action and the story for it uh, has been was heavily, heavily 
fact-checked and reviewed by people like me and Dr. Robert Brown, who's now the head of engineering at the University of Colorado and who was the guy who was really behind the successful landing of the Curiosity rover on Mars. Um, a, a lot of very significant people looked at every single script. And, you know, I remember marking up my copy and saying, no, you can't say this. No, you can't say that. No, you can't do this. But you could say this or you could do this. And everything that we suggested, uh, the producers and directors did. So even though it's an, a fictional account of a possible landing on Mars in 2033 by the first humans, we actually think that everything in it is extremely accurate and realistic. Right down to the fact that in the first episode when there's a problem landing and a thruster is not working and they have to find a bad circuit board and they're calling out the number for that circuit board among hundreds of them in the rocket and the captain is looking for the, that circuit board, that, that number that we're calling out in there is the actual number of an actual circuit board that controls the thrusters in a NASA rocket. So it's down to that level of accuracy. It's really quite amazing. So when you're watching it, you're not seeing something that's made up. You are seeing something that we can't be absolutely certain is true because it hasn't happened yet, but it's, our, it's, it's everybody's best guess of the way it would actually be. So how soon do you think it'll be before the first civilians actually land on Mars should they decide to do this? Well, it depends what the word civilian means. Um, I... It'd be I like do somebody not think, like me. You know, I just decided yeah, I got the I, money, I, let's go. <laughs> well, I I think that's coming in the 2030s, and definitely by the 2040s. So I think definitely within um, 25 years, you will, be, you will be able to buy a ticket to go to Mars. I think the first humans will land well before 2030. That's only 14 years away. Um, but they will very quickly begin building an infrastructure and a base there that will accommodate other people who want to go. You know, it's, it's really very conceivable um, that within as little as 20 years you could actually go to Mars, buy a ticket and go to Mars. Well, that's pretty encouraging thinking, you know, I'm hoping I'll be around in 20 years to see something like this happen, but... You know, that one-way ticket, that kind of has me a little gun-shy. <laughs> well, you, you know, this is, this is a great, uh, to me, um, th as a guy who's getting older, this, this is a great, to me, opportunity for a grand adventure at the end of your life. You know, Elon Musk has said that he wants to die on Mars, preferably not on impact, um, but I can imagine a lot of people, uh, you know, when they get to retirement, um, that this would be, an ex and, you know, their kids are taken care of and life is going along just fine. This would be an, an, an amazing, amazing thing to do at the end of your life, is to go, with, go to Mars and kind of reinvent yourself. Now, I was curious, Stefan, is there a website people can find out more about your book and what's going on here? Yeah, they can just go to National Geographic's website and they'll, find lots. They can find my book on Amazon. Um, it's pretty easy, but nationalgeographic.com is a, is, a, is a great place to go. Um, and if you just search in a Google search for either my name and Mars or Mars National Geographic, you will find everything you need to know. Sounds good. Thank you so much for joining us here on the program. Sounds like we've got some very exciting times ahead of us. Yeah, we do. We do. My pleasure. Well, thank you to the listeners out there for joining us. You've been listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. Sign up for our free weekly e-newsletter by visiting us at beyond50radio.com. We also encourage you to visit us and follow us on Twitter and Facebook as well at Beyond 50 Radio. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. This is the Beyond 50 radio program. And remember, live your day past halfway.